Hello, Professor Leon here. Uh, we are talking tonight about social contract theory. And in particular, we will be looking at uh, the work of Thomas Hobbes. Let me pull him up here on the interwebs. Here is a Encyclopedia of Philosophy, peer-reviewed, so a good source. Uh, he is an English philosopher, uh, writing in the early 1600s, late 1500s. So st not strictly speaking chronologically, since last week we looked at uh, egoism and Ayn Rand, who was writing uh, after Thomas Hobbes. Uh, however, Thomas Hobbes his philosophy of social contract follows in our study of the ethical theories uh, because it's kind of an answer to Ayn Rand's depiction of the world as a dog-eat-dog uh, -dog survival of the fittest kind of thinking. Um, if we are to live together in society, we need to figure out how to do that. And so you can be an egoist, as Ayn Rand uh, puts forth as a good thing, by being totally selfish and only thinking about yourself. Uh, but what kind of civilization is that really going to bring to us? Um, I kind of think of the image of the purge, you know, that movie that's come out not too long ago. Um, it's a pretty brutal, violent, miserable place. And in fact, uh, that's the phrase that Hobbes uses to describe what he calls a state of nature. Uh, so if there is no ethics in place uh, of any sort, to give us guidance or restrain how we should act towards each other. Uh, as we live socially, there aren't, just aren't enough islands to go around, and arguably we might actually need each other to survive. Uh, but if we live socially in a state of nature, uh, it's a pretty brutal place. Uh, he goes into some length of how we won't be able to do anything. Uh, we won't be able to do business. We won't be able to do science. Uh, we won't be able to do art. Uh, we really can't do anything if we are always concerned simply about a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of living. If all we can do is procreate eat and kill each other for sur survival for uh, food and sex, well, it's not going to be a very prosperous, much less pr pleasurable kind of world. Uh, he describes it instead as we will live in continual fear, danger of violent death, and the life of man would be solitary poor, nasty, brutish, and short. The state of nature would be awful, says Hobbes, due to the four basic facts about human life. Now, these are his presumptions, or his assumptions, or his premises. Uh, when you realize and state your assumptions up front, uh, then it's not called an assumption anymore. It's your premise. It's the beginning beliefs that you start your argument from, that you base your argument on. And Hobbes it says that these are things he knows about human life. There's an equality of need. Everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs uh, shelter. Uh, and you might list other things on there, but these are the very basics. Uh, there is scarcity. 
There's not enough to go around. There's not enough food and shelter for everyone. Um, now, some philosophers will take question to this. You know, maybe there is. I don't know. Uh, you can question his assumptions, question his premises in arguing against him. But first, let's try to understand Hobbes's position uh, and see where he's coming from and what the um, social contract is before we move forward to criticizing it. Uh, he says, third assumption or premise, uh, there, the essential equality of human power. Some people might be stronger, some people might be more clever, um, but, you know, given enough time, really anybody can best you. Even the strongest, smartest person uh, can be brought down uh, through maybe people working together, uh, maybe a fluke of nature. They get a virus, right? Uh, all kinds of science fiction based on that idea. And finally, there is limited altruism, meaning that um, even if, well, how do I say this? Let's, let's, Hobbes assumes that every, that there is no altruism. He assumes the worst case scenario, that everyone is selfish and only out for their own good. Now that's a descriptive statement, unlike Ayn Rand, who says you should be selfish. Um, Hobbes, who's writing before Ayn Rand, is saying, well, even if people do have some urge to care for other people, you know, even maybe just the, the babies they make, right? Um, you're not wholly selfish, uh, but you still, there's going to be a limit to it. At a certain point, you're going to put you, yourself or your family, your offspring ahead of other people. So there's a limit to altruism. So these are his four starting premises uh, that there's, we all need the same stuff. There's not enough stuff to go around. Uh, everybody is about the same on the power scale. Uh, so we can, for the most part, everyone will lose at some point in time and push come to shove we're all going to put ourselves first at some point um, it's not an unbelievable description of human life at all uh, so there's a lot of truth to it you might argue some of the details uh, but there is as I say a lot of truth to it uh, but it's a pretty grim picture. Um, now he does get a fair bit, a fair bit of support uh, in actual descriptive sociology, uh, as our text points out, and as Hobbes points out. Uh, this is not mere speculation. As, you, as you've noticed, a lot of our philosophy, a lot of our ethics that we've been going through up to this point, is based on speculation. Uh, what we think God's will might be, what we think might be natural uh, hardwired tendencies of different kinds of people in nature. I mean, a lot of speculation, none of it proven. Uh, but Hobbes points out that this is what actually happens when governments collapse during civil uprisings. People hoard food, they arm themselves, and they lock out their neighbors altruism just goes right out the window. Um, again, pretty strong evidence for his state of nature. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get out of this state of nature and not live in this doggy dog purge world? Uh, his idea is what he calls the social contract. To escape the state of nature, we must find a way to work together. In a stable and cooperative society, we can produce more essential goods and distribute them in a rational way. Um, and we do see this wherever society arises and, and civilization uh, is formed. Uh, he calls this agreement, oh, here, I'm skipping, uh, people must agree on rules to govern their interactions. They must agree, for example, 
not to harm one another and not to break their promises. This is the beginning. I'm not going to kill you. You're not going to kill me. And if I promise I'm going to trade you a goat for a cow, I'm going to keep my promise. Hobbes calls this agreement the social contract. And as a society, we follow certain rules and we have ways to enforce them. Uh, some of those involve what we eventually call law. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and he says all of these rules that we agree upon become our social contract. Now, he would say uh, that uh, this may begin locally, right? We have villages that have uh, very limited specific social contracts, but one can argue that today in 2016, we have a social contract that encompasses the entire earth. Um, that may very well be true. We might make a social contract with the entire human race. Uh, some will argue that, some will not. Uh, he's writing uh, quite some time ago when the idea of what's going on on the other side of the earth uh, really wasn't a relevant concept. Now, uh, we, he, this chapter then goes into talking about Rousseau, uh, which uh, he writes, the civil state produces a very remarkable change in, them, in human beings. The voice of duty takes the place of physical impulses. He is forced to act on different principles and to consult his reason before listening to his inclinations. So what Rousseau is saying to uh, stand on uh, Hobbes' shoulders in the 1700s is that we no longer need to enforce the social contract. It becomes internalized. And that sense of um, what anyone would do right, or what any rational person would do, or you just know what's right, or you have a conscience, right, that's a very interesting twist. You have a conscience. You've really just internalized the social contract that you've been raised with. So this is a very interesting uh, philosophy uh, because it doesn't depend upon uh, God's will or a nat natural inclination to be altruistic. Uh, it doesn't depend on anything but saying that morality, let me find it here, morality consists in a set of rules governing behavior that rational people will accept on the condition that others accept them as well. And this is an important point. I agree not to lie, and I agree not to kill you, but you have to agree too. Uh, so we all agree to the same rules, and that makes it fair. If somebody breaks the rules and says, well, you follow the rules, you don't lie, you don't cheat, but I'm secretly going to lie and cheat, that's how they get ahead. And it's no longer that they're clever, or as Ayn Rand might say, that they're stronger than us. They're just breaking the social contract. Hey, that's not fair. That's not what we agreed to. Now, it's not a literal agreement between two people, but there's an unwritten contract just by being a member of the United States, just by being a member of the human race. Okay, now let's look at some of the problems with this. The first problem is called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, and I'm going to very much simplify this, so hopefully you will read it in detail. Uh, because it's it really is the situation we find ourselves in. Um, let's say, and they call it the prisoner's dilemma, because let's say you and your buddy 
uh, rob a bank. You both get hauled in and the police put you in two different uh, rooms and they tell you, hey, you know, your buddy Smith, he's going to uh, turn, turn evidence on you, right? We've all, if we've watched our crime dramas, we know how this plays out. So he's going to turn evidence on you. Um, so whoever will testify against the other will get off free. The person you testify against is going to go to jail for five years. Uh, that leaves us in a situation of trying to decide if you should give the evidence and send your friend to jail so you can get away um, before they do, right? Because they only need one of you to give the evidence and confess. Uh, now, if neither one of you confesses, you'll both go free. But neither one of you can give in and give the evidence. Um, the best thing for you to do is for neither one of you to confess. And this isn't exactly how it is in the book um, because I am simplifying it. So the best thing is for neither one of you to confess. And in our situation of the so social contract, the best situation is for us both to uphold the social contract. I don't kill you, you don't kill me. I don't lie to you, you don't lie to me. I don't steal from you, you don't steal from me. But if I don't trust you, and I think you're gonna break the contract, if I think you're gonna turn state's evidence on me, then I need to turn state's evidence on you first, right? So you get yourself in a situation where if you don't trust the other person to be moral, right, to uphold the social contract, uh, then you both lose, right? You both lose. And the person who cheats loses less, um, and that's where you wind up with an Ayn Rand egoism situation again, where the person who's going to lose less is going to be the person who cheats. Uh, yeah, it's it, there's there's not a way out of this. <laughs> well, the only way out of this is to get everyone to keep up their end of the social contract. And so morality at, is seen as the rules that we're all going to follow if we uh, all hold to the social contract. And part of the way to do this is to penalize people we catch cheating. Uh, so whoever breaks uh, the silence, whoever is the, uh, what is it, the stool pigeon, is that what it's called? <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. I don't watch crime dramas. Oh no. Um, but whoever rats out the other person needs to be punished so that they learn to stick to the social contract. All right, there are a lot of benefits to the social contract and to this theory. Uh, let's look at these on page 89. Some advantages. Uh, one of the nice things about the social contract theory is it is very much limited to the, to the social public sector. Uh, things like your sexuality, um, what else? Anything we do inside our own private homes. It doesn't touch it because it, it doesn't matter. It's not a contract we have between each other or, or it's not a contract we have any place except between each other. So if you want to do drugs in your living room, that's your business. Just don't bring it outside. Uh, if you want to be a prostitute, that's your business. Just don't bring it outside. Um, that can be both good and bad. I mean, if you, you want to do drugs and um, have whatever kind of sex life you want to have, that's your business. Uh, part of that seems good. But then when we think about, well, then we have issues of drug addiction, which eventually comes outside. Uh, we have issues of prostitution not being a victimless crime. 
Uh, that brings it outside. Um, and we have some people that might be pedophiles. That brings it outside. Uh, so it's a it's it's got some attractive features to it, uh, but there's a flip side to that coin too. Uh, let's see. What are some other advantages of social contract theory? Mm. Let's see. Yeah, we don't have to wonder what it's based on because it isn't based on some um, God that may or may not exist or if he or she does exist, we don't know that God's will. Um, it's based on something we can all, as rational people, agree on. And if we don't agree on it, then we uh, have methods of deciding what we are going to agree on, uh, like having the Supreme Court decide. And it's always based on rationality and factual evidence. A third thing that's good for it is under what circumstances, and this is a, a big point that is relevant to some of our papers that we might be writing, under what circumstances is it rational to break the rules? We agree to obey the rules only on certain conditions. One condition is that we benefit from the overall arrangement. Think about that. If you are routinely, um, what's the word I want? Um, routinely and as a part of society, if society is arranged for you to be discriminated against, if you can't ever win because the social contract is rigged against you, then you have an argument to break the social contract because the contract's already been broken, right? And you may then break the laws. Uh, this is, of course, civil disobedience this is revolution, uh, and you can make a reasonable argument uh, for breaking the social contract. Uh, this part, number three here, is very important. Uh, Martin Luther King, in his uh, speech from uh, the prison that we looked at, uh, I forget the name of the prison, but I, it's under our videos, and we read it last week. Uh, references breaking the social contract. Uh, this is important that we have a way to change the, the rules, uh, to change morality. Some of the arguments that we looked at, uh, some of the ethical theories that we looked at before, uh, like God's will or it's just natural, don't have a way for us to change the ethics. And that is a problem because sometimes what we have done historically is wrong, right? Slavery, I would argue, is wrong, even if it's the cultural norm. Uh, and I would say it's not natural. Uh, or, and I hope it's not God's will. Uh, so this gives us a way to discuss that and, and say, no, this is breaking the social contract because it is rigged against me. Uh, another part of the social contract that it invalidates it is uh, that some people are not uh, honoring the rules, right? If some people are cheating and they're not living by the social contract, then we have, uh, again, uh, an, a rational justified reason for breaking the social contract if we can't bring them into line. All right, and last but certainly not least as a benefit of the social contract theory is how much can morality demand of us? Uh, it requires that we are impartial, that we give no greater weight to our own interests than to the interests of others. So that's, that's a nice thing. We call that equality. And this is very much a part of social contract theory. Uh, and so that makes it attractive as well. And if you face a situation where you must choose your own death or the deaths of five other people, impartiality uh, can 
can can go and say, well, wait a minute, there's a limit to how much altruism can be asked of me. Um, social contract theory doesn't ask you to be selfless. It It is really uh, kind of a moderate road where you are asked uh, to be uh, impartial or well, not impartial I should say where you are asked to be fair but not selfless okay so those are some of the uh, good parts uh, the attractive parts of social contract theory uh, let's see so uh, 6.4 brings us to the problem of civil disobedience are we ever justified in breaking the laws uh, oh, there it is, the letter from Birmingham City Jail. Uh, this is, if you did not already write your paper for last week's egoism on that, uh, this is a good time to write on Martin Luther King. And let's see. And there's, there's some very good critiques here of Martin Luther King, so I want you to read through this section 6.4 carefully. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, what if some citizens, oh, and I'm not finding the part that I'm looking for. All right, well, but, uh, what if some citizens are denied their basic rights? What if police, instead of protecting them, curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill them with impunity? What if some groups of people are denied a decent education while they and their families are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty? Under such circumstances, the social contract is not being honored. By asking the disadvantaged group to obey the law and respect society's institutions, we are asking them to accept the burdens of social living while being denied its benefits. Uh, this is a very timely topic uh, if you decide also to write on the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Civil disobedience is not uh, unreasonable. Uh, it is a last resort, uh, but if the contract is not being honored, then you have a right to uh, be disobedient. Okay, uh, difficulties for the theory in 6.5. Yeah, there's some difficult problems here. Um, and despite them, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, we still talk about and still think in terms of the social contract theory. This is arguably the first ethical theory that we have looked at, which is very much alive and in use today. Um, yes, we might talk about morality in the terms of our faith or of social norms, but that is never an acceptable uh, final bedrock for our ethical positions uh, because we can't defend our faith or our cultural norms merely through reason. Uh, they're not factually based. They're not based on reason, uh, so we can't base our, our ethics at large for, the, for everyone when we start trying to, to do ethics uh, for how we're all going to live together. Uh, social contract theory is the first step we have towards something that is um, based on facts and reason, and that's why it is still very much alive today. Um, but one of the criticisms of it is that you didn't ever get to choose, right? There's no way to uh, 
uh, opt out. All right, where is it? You've heard people say it. Uh, let's see. You've heard people say it that they're like, well, if you don't like it, get out. All right? None of us ever signed a real contract. When we were born in America, uh, we didn't decide to be Americans. It's just where we happen to be. So we didn't actually choose to join uh, this, this social contract. Uh, how do you opt out? You could become a survivalist and never use electricity, roads, the water service, and so on. Because remember, don't forget it, using electricity, the roads, and the water service buys you into the social contract. Anything you take from society buys you into the social contract. But how do you get out? Um, right, David Hume, 1700s, observed, you're not really free to leave your country in any meaningful sense. How can somebody who is poor have a free choice to leave his country? Right? But this has even grown, grown beyond that uh, because you can't really leave the earth. So we're all kind of stuck with this social contract uh, just by being born. So why do you have to agree? You don't really have a choice. It's not like joining a game whose rules you may reject by walking away. Rather, life is like being thrust into a game you can't walk away from. Uh, the contract theorist uh, has not explained why you have to obey the rules of the game. What if you don't want to? Uh, now, it might be in your best interest, and it probably rationally is. Participating in a sensible social scheme is rational. It really is in one's best interest. This is why the rules are valid. But the survivalist doesn't want to play by the rules. Um, why do the rules still apply to him? So the defense of this, this defense of the social contract theory abandons the idea that morality is based on agreement. However, it holds fast to the idea that morality consists in mutually beneficial rules. Uh, it complies with our earlier definition that morality consists in a set of rules governing behavior that rational people will accept on the condition that others accept them as well. Rational people will accept rules of mutual benefit. Uh, so, somebody who is who doesn't re respond to their own best interest and wants to live in the purge, uh, they're irrational, and we kick them out of of worrying about what they want. Right? And you might not like it, but this is the state that we live in now uh, in a rational civilized world. You're going to have to buy your own island, but even that won't protect you because as we now know, we live in a global environment and so you really aren't uh, ever alone, even on your island. All right. The second objection is much more troubling, absolutely. If this is mutually beneficial for everyone, what do we do for with people who can't participate? Uh, Non-human animals, future generations, oppressed populations, and I think we also add to this um, the mentally and physically handicapped. Uh, dead weight, right? Quote unquote, what what Ayn Rand would call the dead weight. Uh, the social contract doesn't protect them because they don't contribute to our society. Uh, why do we have to, it's not against our interests, right? If we go down here, let's scroll down here. It would not be against our interests to allow uh, such actions like the uh, euthaniz euthanization of the mentally or physically handicapped. Uh, so why should we uh, look after the people who are mentally or physically handicapped. Uh, why not run up the national debt? Uh, I won't be alive, and I'm not going to have any children, so I don't care. 
It's not against my interest. It's not against against our interests. So you can see this has kind of taken the Ayn Rand idea and expanded it to a social contract. So it's not just the social, the circle of me, but now it's the circle of we. Uh, so why do I have to care about things that don't benefit us as a society or as the human race? Um, it's a good question because this is not uh, the social contract theory is grounded in self-interest, but now instead of me, it's we, and it's grounded in reciprocity. I won't shoot you if you don't shoot me. Uh, so it doesn't give us any reason to take care of the weak or to take care of the future if we only have a life expectancy of 100 years. All right, so this is a very serious uh, question, and if you aren't uh, understanding that or anything else in it, uh, either post your question on the uh, outline wiki or on our uh, voice thread, and I'm going to be adding a slide right here, which will be questions of Thomas on Thomas Hobbes' social contract. I will then add a slide for each of the articles that we are going to discuss relative to this uh, ethical theory, and then you can comment to each of those. All right, thank you very much. That is all for tonight, and look forward to an excellent week with everyone.